Hello everybody, we're the Baton App Team. I'm the applicant for the group, Zach Teitel. Uh, I'm studying for my Master's of Education over at OISE. These are our programmers, Victor Chen. Master of Information. And Fiona Zhao. I'm from Computer Science. We're gonna tell you a little bit about our application and how it makes teaching smarter, and we're gonna start with the motivation for our application, why we created it. So as a classroom teacher myself, I find student hand raising to be pretty problematic, and I'll tell you why. One, it doesn't tell me how long students have had their hands up for. Two, it doesn't tell me the order in which they've raised their hands. And three, and most important, it doesn't tell me why students have raised their hands in the first place, which gives me crucial information towards creating a more strategic class flow as a teacher. I'm frustrated by these realities, and the research says that my frustrations are legitimate. Thankfully, we've created an application, Baton, to solve these problems. So let's take a look at how we've done that. So the core function of Baton is the talk function. You'll notice that there are two versions of the application, a student version on your left and a teacher version on your right. These two versions talk to each other when we're in a classroom space to create the intelligent classroom that we're looking for. On the left with the student talk function, you'll see that up here, this is the function that students use when they're in conversation, discussion, or listening to instruction. What it allows students to do is to signal what we call participation intent. In plain English, that could be why a student is participating in the first place. For example, building on a comment. As you see, you can, we'll just run through the buttons, the options that are there. Building on a comment, uh, questioning something, challenging a comment, or adding a new idea to class. What happens when a student selects one of those uh, participation intent descriptors is a talk ticket is created and it's sent to the, stu or to the teacher app, sorry, over on the right hand side. And you can see kind of how that would happen. You can see the icons would pop up in real time. What this allows the teacher to do, what it gives the teacher is four key pieces of information. One, it gives the teacher a visualization of student wait time. How long a student's been waiting to participate. Simply put, the icon starts at green. The longer the student waits, the redder it gets. John's been waiting a long time. Two, up in the top, we see participation intent. The Tetris block up there tells me that John wanted to build on something that was set in class. Three, in the lower uh, bubble, we see how many times John has participated. So John's particip participated once. And four, as the teacher, I get a visualization of the sequence of hand raising. As students participate using their version of the app, their icons pop up on mine in real time in order, telling me what order they participated in. Additionally, from teaching experience, we know that students are more likely to participate when they see other students participating as well. In order to address this, we created the buddies list, which you can see there, which mimics the environment of a typical classroom, showing students that other students are in fact participating. Um, all of this is to really reveal previously hidden information towards a more strategic class flow. And to get an idea of that class flow, let's do a quick demo right now. So we're just gonna switch up here to our doc camera. And that should work. Yep, okay. <clears throat> So imagine, if you will, that we're in a classroom right now. I'm the teacher, Mr. Teitel. These are my students, Victor and Fiona. And we have a couple of other students out in the audience. We got Nate and Alex over there. For our purposes today, the rest of you are gonna be silent observers. I'm gonna walk you through a use case and talk, kind of explain what's going on, which is pretty much the most important part. Um, make sure to pay attention to the screen just so you can get an idea of kind of how the app is interacting with what's going on in our use case. Uh, it's a little bit fuzzy, so kind of you're gonna have to kind of bear with us in terms of iconography and me explaining what's happening a little bit. So just a quick refresher, we're in a high school civics classroom. We're talking about specifically who's gonna be the next mayor of Toronto. And uh, in order to get through this, I'm gonna use the time in, time out system. Some of you might be familiar with it from Saved by the Bell with Zach Morris. If you don't get the reference, that's okay, but uh, it'll work anyways, okay? So time in. Okay guys, who do you think should be the next mayor of Toronto? Oh. It looks like Fiona has a new idea. Fiona, what do you think? Um, Rob Ford? I don't know. <laughs> Time out. Okay, so what you might have noticed, audience, is that Fiona seems to be like a shy student. She seems particularly shy. Firstly, you know, I want to build up her confidence as a teacher. I'm thinking, how can I get her to participate next time? It was a big risk for her to participate first, and it was definitely a big risk for her to openly endorse Mayor Ford. So I really, I really want to be boosting her confidence. You know, how can I do that? Well, what Baton allows me to do is to strategically navigate the participation that happens. While I've been talking to you, three other students have participated. Now, in a traditional classroom, I'd probably pick the first person that raised their hand. That's all I can go with. Here we see that Alex was next to participate with a question, then Nate with a challenge. Victor was third to participate with a build comment. That's who I want. 
I want Victor to build on what Fiona said because she's shy and I want to use this opportunity to boost her confidence so that she's more likely to participate next time. What Baton allows me to do is strategically navigate that situation. Traditional hand raising, it's a guessing game. Time back in. Okay, Victor, it looks like you want to build on something that Fiona said. What do you think? Well, I think I agree with Fiona. I think Robbie Frost should be mayor. Okay. <laughs> Time out again. So now as the teacher, the next thing I have to do is to decide who's next to participate. Obvious choice or simple choice usually, right? The first guy who's in line, Alex. But Alex has a question. That might lead us down a tangent to something, to some place I don't want to be just yet, right? I want to continue with this line of thought. Nate has a challenge. You can't really see it there, but we have the icon for challenge in place there. So I want to go with Nate, who's going to challenge something that's already out on the floor. What I'm doing here is making a strategic decision to ignore order of participation in favor of continuity of thought. So again, something that Baton lets us do that traditional hand raising wouldn't. So time back in. Okay, Alex, I see you got a question. Hold on to that question for me, man. Nate, uh, I see you want to challenge something that's on the floor. What do you think? Rob Ford is a criminal. <laughs> he can't be there. But I think Olivia is a woman for that job. Okay. <laughs> Time out again. And we'll actually, we'll call the scene there. Okay? So essentially the idea here is that Baton is allowing me as a teacher to make decisions from an informed, intelligent place. Again, with traditional hand raising, it's a guessing game. But making Baton actually, you know, it was pretty difficult. There were some pretty big challenges we had. And to tell us a little bit more about those technical challenges, uh, Fiona is going to talk now. We're going to switch back to our... Yep. Okay, thanks, Zach. And so one big challenge we faced was how we could manage to synchronize multiple devices with multiple types of, of information. Actually, we have two types of uh, con different types of uh, content uh, needed to be transmitted via the cloud. The first is the um, tickets from student to teacher, and the second is the participation information from the cloud to student. And also, uh, our app need to catch very fast pace in the classroom. So given this needs, we understood that without the ability to synchronize multiple devices in a real-time way, our app would essentially be useless. At first, we were not sure how that's going to happen, but later we found the Google Cloud messaging and we successfully applied it um, to solve the major problem for us. Okay, next we're going to talk a little bit about our key learning. So our key learning actually revolved more around um, group work and kind of teamwork than it did around technical issues. The first thing that we took away as a shared group was that we really had to be honest. Honesty was the best policy. We kind of love that Nathaniel Hawthorne quote, accuracy is the brother of honesty. In order to reflect an accurate version of our shared vision of design and development, we needed to be really, really honest with each other. As we went through the process, we got much better at this, speaking our mind, listening when people were speaking their mind, and it led to a much more intelligent version of the app and a more efficient process. And the second takeaway, the second takeaway is just how important the spiral process is. And in moving from one spiral to the next, we were forced to make decisions on the product necessity and priority. And so, um, uh, yeah, and um, so it does increase the productivity and more intelligent decisions are uh, in, in creating our minimal viable product. Okay, and now let's quick look at the future works. And the first piece of future work is of course the work type, which including the initial design plan and also work type where a lot of students to self assess the problem when, the, when they are working. And uh, the, so the teacher can make strategic decisions about the order in which they help the students. Well, the next is the data aggregation and uh, reporting, which is the data already collected and organized in the server. So the next step is virtualizing the student data so that the teacher can use to get their future instruction and assessment. The last uh, but not least, we should make it prettier. So because people know pretty, right? <laughs> and on that note, we shall say thank you for your time and uh, looking for the button in the Google Play Store in San Jose. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, that as a teacher, when you're going through and you're addressing students, does, can you push something on your device to say, okay, you've already talked to them so they don't repeat themselves sometimes when you get in a discussion? Totally. So, in fact, during our demo, uh, we kind of had a last minute addition. We didn't even think about demoing that. And somebody suggested, you should show everybody that you can do that. And I totally forgot. So once Fiona speaks, for example, I just long press and she disappears. And if I wanted to wipe everybody, 
I can just hit reset all and everybody disappears. It's a really great question. So we're making a big assumption here, and it's one that is obviously not gonna be foolproof, but it's one that, in my experience, three years high school teaching here and, and more years abroad, it's a, it's a safe assumption in some ways to make, which is that it's very rare that a student is gonna enter in 2014 anywhere, a, a teenager, without their smartphone. It's their tie to everything. It really is like cutting off a limb. I've said this before in this class, but I, it's really true. Yeah, it's, it's essentially without that, without that device, they're a social pariah. They're dead to everybody else. So they don't, they don't forget it ever. In fact, when you take away a device from a student now, it really is like you're chopping their hand off and putting it into your drawer to give it back to them later. That, that's, how, that's how in touch they are with their and technology. Te uh, and technically speaking, we didn't bound the account to the, uh, to the specific device. You can just log in with, uh, with any kind of uh, any devices from other people. But your point is fair, and, and we've t I've talked about it already in terms of a how it could go down and you could potentially, if a school really wants to use it, they could maybe get, you know, a nice donation from Huawei or somebody to <laughs> give them some devices so that they have them on yeah. can, you, can you just repeat that comment you made a, a many classes ago about the rich, richer and poorer high schools use? Yes, absolutely. So uh, someone had asked in, an, in another class about what happened, you know, does every classroom have, everybody has a device? And in my experience, I've worked in uh, inner city environments, I've worked in international environments, I've worked in very affluent schools. I've had a wide range of experience in every single classroom I've been in. I can't stress this enough. Every single teenager has a smartphone. It doesn't matter what community you're in. Again, it goes back to the idea of the social pariah. Even if I don't have the money for a smartphone, I'm gonna find a way to get one. Because if I don't, I walk out of my house and I don't have a computer and nobody's talking to me. Like, it's that simple. Uh, we have to move on. I think there's, oh, there's another class here next. Thank you very much.